not that the words of Section 230 are perfect and sacrosanct, uh, but that the principles that it protects are really important. Welcome to Elise and Ashley Break the Internet, a series where we're exploring the ins and outs of Section 230, the law from the 90s that may or may not shape the future of the internet. I'm Elise Dick, Research Fellow at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. We are a tech policy think tank based in Washington, D.C. And I'm Ashley Johnson. I'm a research analyst covering internet policy at ITIF. In this episode, we'll be looking into the future of intermediary liability in Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Joining us, we have Neil Chilson, Senior Research Fellow for Technology and Innovation at the Charles Koch Institute and former Chief Technologist of the Federal Trade Commission. Neil has written and spoken extensively on Section 230, and we're so glad to have him. Welcome to the podcast, Neil. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, To start off, a very general question that will hopefully guide our conversation. The internet has changed a lot since 1996, and do you think Section 230 has kept up? Uh, So yeah, the internet has changed a lot since 1996. um, And in part, a lot of those changes were made possible by Section 230. Uh, Section 230 allowed for the user-generated content platforms that we all use every day. Uh, And while the internet has changed a lot, the basic problem that Section 230 uh, tried to solve, which is called the moderator's dilemma, um, has not, if anything, it's gotten uh, worse. Um, The challenge uh, of content moderation, moderation has Uh, increased quite a lot since uh, the days of Prodigy and CompuServe. Um, Twitter deals with a volume of content uh, every second um, that probably dwarfed what Prodigy had, um, you know, in a a day uh, content-wise. And so uh, so I think the volume has changed quite a lot, and the moderator's dilemma has gotten, um, if anything, worse. And so Section 230 is still a really key part of keeping the user-generated content uh, platforms that we we have and enjoy today. Um, I want to talk about the statement that you gave at the Department of Justice workshop on Section 230 in February of 2020. You outlined seven key principles for evaluating proposed changes changes to Section 230, and I'd like to talk about a few of those. Sure. First, you emphasize that intermediary liability laws must not target constitutionally protected speech. Can you give an example of proposed changes that would target constitutionally protected speech and how that would play out? Uh, So uh, some of the proposed changes that we've seen around um, political speech uh, that would that would say require a a neutral treatment of political speech uh, in order to get the protections of Section 230. Um, uh, Political speech is at the heart of uh, free speech and the the ability to um, associate yourself with political commentary that you uh, support and to disassociate yourself from political commentary that you don't support is a pretty core First Amendment right. And so um, some of these suggested approaches that would uh, condition Section 230 protections on not being able to do that uh, go pretty much to the heart of the First Amendment uh, protections and raise a lot of um, constitutional issues. So that might be one example. And if one of those proposed changes were to be passed into law, do you think that the courts would uphold them or that they would not pass First Amendment scrutiny? Well, uh, I think they would very likely strike down that type of condition. Um, But there are some other types that are even more directly uh, problematic um, uh, that one at least tries to say, hey, we're just trying to have you be neutral. Um, but uh, there have been other proposals that would straight out prohibit certain types of speech that are constitutionally protected. Um, and those would be much more, even more likely to be struck down. You uh, have touched on and you emphasized in your seven principles that Section 230 does not and should not require neutrality. Do you know where the misconception that Section 230 requires neutrality came from, and why do you think it's so important that it doesn't? Uh, I'm not really sure about the origin of the idea that Section 230 requires neutrality. I think, if I had to guess, it's in part because a lot of the platforms um, 
have long claimed to try to be open to as much speech as possible. Um, and sometimes have couched that in the language of, of neutrality. Uh, and so have set sort of an expectation that people have, uh, that has never really been fully true, right? The platforms have never been wide open spaces where people can say whatever they want, um, in part because that because consumers would not like that very much. Users would, would hate a platform that's like that for the most part. There are some places, 8chan, et cetera, that, that look a little bit more like that. Uh, but even they take down content when you know it's clearly illegal, um, uh, and so so I think that you know I, I'm not 100 percent sure where that where that came from, except it's a sort of convenient way to try to push the platforms in a direction that certain people want. Um, and what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. Why do you think it's so important that Section 230 does not require neutrality? Well. Uh, not only does it not require neutrality, it, it it's created to allow people to edit uh, without raising a bunch of risk of spurious litigation. And so um, a requirement of neutrality, first of all, is very difficult to define. Um, even, uh, even in a limited space like political neutrality, uh, things like satire can be very hard to figure out whether it's criticizing one side or supporting it. Um, and so... Uh, so the, the enforcing neutrality, um, requiring neutrality, uh, if there was a law that did that, um, is very hard to pull off just practically. And so uh, the importance of having the ability for platforms to, to moderate uh, gets back to that moderator's dilemma. Um, they're trying to create a environment that is supportive for the community of their users. Um, a neutrality requirement would just get in the way of that. It would turn every platform into, if it worked at all, it would turn every platform uh, into the sort of same space, and we wouldn't have, uh, we wouldn't have the ability to have different platforms that have different communities uh, and different maybe standards uh, for and, and purposes for what we want. So you know, just to take a, a really extreme example, a requirement of neutrality might might say something like. A church website would then have to leave up any posts that had nothing to do or may even be sort of uh, offensive to many of the users of that website um, if they were to take a First Amendment style approach to the content where many things that are distasteful to, you know, not just people who might go to church websites, but um, to, a lot, to, to probably the average American uh, are protected by the First Amendment. And so requiring a First Amendment approach or a neutral approach um, would would create, uh, you know, websites that are much less friendly to the users of the communities that want to use them. And are there any other objectives that you think policymakers and other stakeholders should really prioritize when considering amendments or alternatives to Section 230? Well, uh, you know, I, I think one of the key things is to consider the impact on innovation. Um, in tech policy, that's always a key consideration because um, because the tech industry has is you know moves forward in leaps and bounds in innovation. And um, the questions around you know how Section two hundred and thirty and changes to it would affect not just the largest players but some of the smaller players and not just platforms that have users on them that are directly consumer facing, but other types of uh, internet services uh, such as caching services or uh, you know, spam filtering services. Uh, I think we have to think really hard about what the impact of a change in how liability uh, works for these types of companies would affect their ability to come up with new services, to come up with uh, things that make uh, consumers better off. And so that's, that's a key one. Um, yeah, I think that's a really important critical one. Great. Well, I think now is the time to start taking a look in our crystal ball and talking about the future of 230. Um, so going off of what you just said, looking into the more immediate future, uh, how would you like to see the Biden administration approach intermediary liability and platform regulation? And specifically, who do you think should be invo involved in that process? and should not be involved in that process as far as government actors or other stakeholders? Yeah, so 
You know, I, I wrote a piece for protocol um, that digs into Section 230 and talks a little bit about uh, the history and um, the way that Section 230, in some ways, arguably shortcut a evolutionary common law approach um, to defamation. Um, and that had some pluses and minuses. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll be the first to say that Section 230 is, you know, words written by Congress, it's not perfect. I think it even has a typo in it, right? And so, um, it's it's not that it's not that the words of Section two hundred and thirty are perfect and sacrosanct, um, but that the principles that it protects are really important um, and pretty common sense. That users, you know, the person who does something bad online should be the person responsible, uh, not the tool that they use. Um, I would like the I would hope that the Biden administration would continue to see the. Um, the, the need for that type of common sense approach uh, to liability online. Um, but more importantly, uh, changes to Section 230 to the extent that they are necessary. And I think there's some places where we could talk about third party liability or for, you know, sales of dangerous objects online. Like there's some there's some places to talk about this. And clearly there are harms. Uh, that can happen that seem unjust or unfair when when uh, somebody who's harmed can't get at the bad actor who actually did something. Um, there, there are some things we can talk about, but the people that should be looking at that is Congress. I mean, statutes are written by Congress. Statutes should be modified by Congress. Um, the idea that an agency like the Federal Communications Commission, for example, who has never professed to to have any authority over Section 230 uh, would would go in and essentially correct the courts on what the statute says or how the statute should be interpreted. Um, that's a bad idea. It's a it's a uh, it's a dangerous idea, and it also seems unlikely to make any of the people who have been pushing for that in the the recent past happy with the results. Um, you know, it's just sort of mind boggling to me that uh, Trump administration would be pushing this off to an agency that is going to be run by, uh, you know, Biden appointees in the near future and would expect that even though the, that the result would be good for you know, conservatives or for Trump himself. So um, Congress should work this out. It's, there's some difficult problems here. Um, Congress is the right place to, to change the law if the law needs to be changed. Great. And so tech, Section 230 is sort of the hot topic right now, but obviously it's not the only topic in tech policy. Um, do you think there are any lessons we can learn from Section 230 and the surrounding case law that we could apply to some of the other areas mm -hmm. of tech policy that are starting to enter the, the political and legislative conversation? Well, the, the big one and uh, that I would you know, I point the listeners to the, the protocol article again, is that Section 230 in many ways, even though it is a statute, it is, it's, it's had a very uh, evolutionary approach, right? The language, the general principles of Section 230 have been applied case by case hundreds of times to different factual situations. And we've gotten to see how the law works and how it doesn't. Um, and the courts have made it have have made it work over time, and so it's been able to adapt to an internet that has changed quite a lot. Um, uh, it's been able to still convey those important principles, even though the technology that it's that it's working on has changed quite a lot. So I think that um, that idea that incremental case by case approaches, even though they don't they're they're not these big grand schemes of regulation to solve problems, that they can often um, keep up with technology better than we might think, um, in part because you don't have to predict the future nearly as much. You just have to set the, the regulatory goal that you're trying to achieve, in this case, who's responsible for content and who isn't, um, and then uh, see how that works out over time. Uh, and you know, there's always a possibility for Congress to tweak something um, as it needs to be. But the chances of a general principle-based approach like Section 230 going out of date um, is much is much lower than for you know some very detailed specific approach around content moderation or any of the other tech issues that we're looking at, whether it be 
antitrust or privacy, um, uh, you know, and maybe data security and some other issues. Um, there's times when a detailed prescriptive rule can be appropriate um, when an industry is maybe not as fast moving and it's extremely well understood by the regulator or the uh, legislator. Uh, but that's not really the current condition of the internet. And uh, that's to the benefit of consumers, actually, that fast innovation cycle. And so I think we should try to look to regulatory and legislative approaches that um, can continue to enable that type of rapid innovation. So it's not just other areas of policy, but there's also a lot of new emerging technologies that we could talk about. Um, do you think that the current debate obviously is focused on social media platforms? Do you think there are other emerging technologies that might raise similar concerns or that uh, 230 might apply to in the near or more distant future? I, I'm not sure that the the legal issues are that different for uh, a bunch of these new technology. It's like I, like I was saying, uh, Section 230, because it sets out a sort of general high-level principle, has been able to adapt to new technologies. But it will be interesting to see how these issues play out, um, for example, in virtual reality. Because of the tangibility of a space like that, uh, in some ways, there's there will be additional concerns that will be raised around how people use those tools how the users use those tools in ways that could be offensive or uh, perhaps threatening to uh, other users on those platforms. And there will be questions about who should be responsible for that. And I think Section 230 will be an important tool to allow the huge benefits. And I think this is the thing that I, I, I emphasized a lot in my DOJ testimony is the benefits aren't just to the individual user uh, or to the platforms. Um, what we get with these platforms is the ability to form these small communities that we could never, if we had to run it by Facebook, Facebook's lawyers or by the, you know, the VR platforms lawyers um, uh, to have a community that talked about, for example, you know, some sort of rare medical issue uh, that was like a support group. Um, these, these platforms wouldn't take on that type of liability. It'd be too risky for them um, to have people providing, you know, advice back and forth, even though that those types of communities can be very, very uh, helpful and very supportive to people who are going through something that's unusual and where they don't know anybody in real life who's gone through it. And so um, I worry about, well, I'm excited about the potential of new technologies to allow that type of small communities uh, that address you know, niche problems and niche interests to continue to develop. Um, and I I just worry that without Section 230, those types of interactions online would be, um, if not uh, eliminated completely, they, they would be much harder to achieve. The, the legal frictions and the commercial frictions would be much higher. Definitely. I think that's a really great point. And Ashley knows that I'm very happy we got a VR plug in there. It's very important. Uh, <laughs> so our last question on the future of 230, what would your ideal scenario be for the future of intermediary liability, content moderation, online speech, all of the things that get wrapped up in the 230 debate. And uh, what will it take to get there if we can at all? You know, I, I don't know that there's are, there are a ton of changes to Section 230 that are uh, super important to take place. I think there are some, some edge issues that perhaps Congress could address. I think there are a lot of opportunities for um, innovation in how content moderation works, however, and in a way that helps diffuse some of the issues, perhaps. Um, right now, uh, a lot of the approaches to content moderation are very centralized. And uh, if you know anything about um, me or my past writings, uh, I'm a big fan of decentralized uh, solutions. I'm writing a book uh, actually on emergent order right now that's going to talk a little bit about content moderation. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities for the platforms to look to the communities themselves that are forming on their platforms for guidance on how to do content moderation well. Um, some of the platforms do this a lot right now already. I mean, Reddit, Reddit has a really strong role for its um, participants and its users in self-governance. And I think providing more tools that look like that, uh, I think there's a lot, there's a big opportunity to, um, you know, 
increase the responsiveness of content moderation to the needs of users while uh, you know showing showing regulators in DC that something is being done around content that they're worried about and that speech is that and that these platforms are still places where people can say can speak their mind to uh, to an audience um, not without consequence because that's not the way speech should be I mean speech speech has consequences if it didn't um, it wouldn't be very important so um, so uh, these platforms uh, have been very powerful in letting people speak to audiences um, and I think there's a lot of innovation that could happen around decentralized uh, content moderation that could make that even um, more powerful. For our final question that we're going to ask all of our guests, we want to ask you your verdict on Section 230 overall. Should we keep it? Should we amend it? Or should we repeal it? Uh, we should keep Section 230. Um, you know, perhaps in a alternate universe where Section 230 wasn't passed, um, the courts would have come to something that looks sort of Section 230-ish like in First Amendment law. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, uh, Professor Goldman has made a good case that in many ways, Section 230, um, builds on the First Amendment, uh, in a way that has really opened up an entirely new way for people to speak to broad audiences without having to go through gatekeepers. Um, and that's really, um, that's been a, to the huge benefit of so many, uh, so many people, so many, um, minority or, or uh, you know, niche ideas, um, you know, pluses and minuses to that. But overall, Section 230 has been a, a great boon to uh, speech online. Um, and in the world that we're in right now, uh, it makes a ton of sense to keep it around. Thank you so much. Very well said. Thanks for joining us, Neil. If you want to hear more from Neil, you can follow him on Twitter at Neil underscore Chilson. That's it for this episode. If you liked it, then please be sure to rate us and tell your friends and colleagues to subscribe. You can find the show notes and sign up for a weekly email newsletter on our website, itif.org. And be sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn at ITIFDC. DC.